Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague for sharing his time with me. I'm very pleased to address one of the most important issues facing our country. I'm extremely proud of the work our government has done to address climate change, both here in Canada and internationally. Climate change is a global challenge that first and foremost needs a global solution. I'm also pleased to say that our government is the first Canadian government to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This reduction, 4.8% lower emissions when compared to 2005, is significant and should be recognized as such, particularly because our economy has grown by 8.4% over the same period. This reduction is significant because a generation from now, Canadians will look back and see that it was this Prime Minister and this Minister of the Environment that ushered in a new era of pragmatic and effective greenhouse gas reduction. This reduction will not satisfy our critics here today. <clears throat> I know firsthand of the passion the member from Halifax has for the environment and for climate change in particular. I can respect that passion, but Mr. Speaker, I'm here to remind her today that what is critical for Canadians, and indeed the world, is to have a climate change strategy that is balanced. Any plan must be effective and achievable, and the important balance to strike is to lower emissions, like our government has done since 2005, without disrupting our economy. We have to work collaboratively with Canadian employers and Canadians themselves to achieve meaningful targets. We cannot be tempted to foist unachievable and potentially disruptive policies from Ottawa on employers across the country at a time when employment is tenuous in Canada and when families are worried of a job loss for mom or dad. While the NDP have well-intentioned but incredibly naive plans with respect to climate change, I must also, Mr. Speaker, highlight the sorry track record of the Liberal Party with respect to this file. While the last Liberal government liked to talk an incredibly good game with respect to climate change and the Kyoto Protocol, the reality is that their government did absolutely nothing to address greenhouse gas emissions. Nothing. The Liberal critic continues the strategy of talking a very good game. She claims her speech in this House today was well-researched and free of, of hyperbole. She spoke with conviction about Liberal plans, strategies, one-ton challenges, signings, announcements. But the reality is that nothing serious was done to lower emissions by the Liberal government. To the contrary, the Liberals talked as if they were doing something, appeared very attentive to the issue, even named pets after Kyoto, but after you pushed aside this window dressing, Mr. Speaker, their true record is on display. The record shows that the Liberal Party led Canada through one of the largest periods of increasing greenhouse gas emissions. I saw, I saw a new Liberal commercial for their leader, and he says he's been working hard in recent months to earn trust. I would invite him also to study hard, study the record of his party when it comes to climate change. Studying this, this record on climate change would make a good lesson at Degrassi High or any school in Canada on the meaning of the term hypocrisy. Mr. Speaker, this government is also attempting to work actively and constructively with all our international partners. The Prime Minister and this Minister have consistently built solid and professional relationships with our trading partners on environmental issues. This stands in sharp contrast to the NDP, who are only too happy to travel to the United States to use Washington as a bully pulpit to attack their own country. Sadly, they do not even seem to realize that this undermines their very credibility as a party that wants to lead Canada. To be effective, an international climate change agreement must involve meaningful commitments by all major emitters. Countries involved in the ongoing negotiations under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change have now moved beyond the Kyoto Protocol towards a new comprehensive international climate change agreement that will include significant action to reduce greenhouse emissions by all the world's major economies. Canada is part of this international movement, Mr. Speaker. Under the 2009 Copenhagen Accord, Canada made a solid commitment to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 17% from 2005 levels. 
The commitment set a goal of reaching these reductions by 2020. We stand by this commitment and are taking a sector-by-sector -sector regulatory approach to reducing emissions with the goal to meet this target. Our approach also works with Canadian employers to help sector, sectors achieve their targets while providing that important balance to ensure our economy keeps moving forward and the men and women from across our country keep their jobs in these challenging economic times. Mm -hmm. Our government has already expressed our intention to continue this work <coughs> with our international partners in establishing a new post-2020 climate change agreement that will more effectively serve to meet global climate change goals. Mr. Speaker, this is not to say that international action cannot take place until a new agreement is established. Indeed, Canada has been actively collaborating with international partners outside the United Nations process for effective action that can be implemented now. The Prime Minister and his ministers travel around the world to work collaboratively and effectively with our global community while NDP politicians travel the world only to find new ways and new locations to score political points, weaken our reputation and denigrate Canadian employers. Mr. Speaker, you need only look back a few weeks to see Canadian leadership and collaboration in this regard. At the Major Economies Forum, Canada took a leadership role to address short-lived climate pollutants. These include methane, hydrofluorocarbons and black carbon. It's estimated that these pollutants, whose lifetime in the atmosphere is shorter than long-lived gases like carbon dioxide, will contribute significantly to global warming in the coming decades. These short-lived climate pollutants are of particular concerns to Arctic countries like Canada because they may be responsible for the more rapid warming we are currently experiencing in the far north, notably due to the effect of black carbon deposited on snow and ice. Another long-standing initiative in this area is the Global Methane Initiative. This March, Canada hosted the Methane Expo in Vancouver, an international meeting and technology forum. Addressing methane emissions can result in a range of benefits, including air quality, human health, and sustainable development. Canada has also been working to address these pollutants within the Arctic Council. As a founding member and lead partner in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, established in early 2012. We've been very encouraged to see the coalition grow from seven to over 56 partners. Canada was the first out of the gate on this critical initiative by donating three million to the coalition and the Minister of the Environment just announced this month that Canada will contribute a further 10 million. Mr. Speaker, in meeting and in fact exceeding the joint developed country goal under the Copenhagen Accord to mobilize fast start financing in the period from 2010 to 12, Canada and other industrialized countries have provided funding of over $33 billion to help strengthen the capacity of developing countries that are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and contribute to global mitigation efforts. And I'd like to talk about some of these countries that we've been helping directly. In Haiti, 4.5 million of fast start financing helped build climate resilience through rehabilitating 253 kilometers of shoreline, planting 500,000 trees, and the construction of nearly 50, 15 kilometers of irrigation corridors. In Lesotho, 1.2 million went to support an 18-month feasibility study for the development of two potential wind power projects with a combined potential of 900 megawatts. In Honduras, 5 million in Canadian support is unlocking up to 50 million to allow a local bank to provide affordable financing for renewable energy and energy efficiency improvements at small and medium-sized businesses. Mr. Speaker, the track record of this government is clear. We are working on reducing emissions at home and are taking a major role internationally to help developing countries address climate change impacts and grow sustainably. Our plan is balanced, collaborative and effective, both at home and abroad. I think Canadian employers can find solace in the fact that our government is going to work collaboratively with them, industry by industry, to, to reach achievable goals without disrupting our economy and potentially putting Canadians in a position of unemployment. These are important times, Mr. Speaker, and our government has taken important steps to make sure we address the reduction of greenhouse gases. Thank you. Good job. Questions and comments?
the uh, la député de Abitib, uh, pardon, uh, uh, Gaspésie, Ile de la Madeleine. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, I listened attentively to, uh, to my colleague's uh, um, discourse just now, and I, I find it surprising that he's saying that this government is the one that's taken the most action. I think one of the, one of the reasons why g greenhouse gas emissions are actually dropping in this country is because the economic activity is dropping. Here, here. I, don't think that he, I don't think he should be laying any claim to, to any kind of uh, plan on this, that, that in, unless he's saying that it was a g government's plan to actually reduce economic activity in this country. I don't, th I, I don't think he has any, any claim to fame on this. I'm also surprised to hear that he's talking about how they're, they're helping worldwide wind farms to, to be installed to help with uh, greenhouse gas emissions, when in fact in Canada they're actually reducing the amount of support that they're giving. Why doesn't he show me how he's going to support the wind farms in my riding as to how we're going to increase our development of those wind farms instead of start, starting studies in Ontario, studies on whether uh, the sounds that wind farms make could possibly have negative health effects on individuals, studies which have been performed at numerous times by our international partners and numerous times in Quebec as well. So the studies are already in, the results are in, we know what the results are in those studies, so why don't we actually support the wind power industry in this country actively instead of just giving lip service to, the, to wind farms in other countries. Thank you. I will member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to, to thank the member for his uh, statement slash questions. Um, I, I'll address the first, first one. Um, the NDP likes to mock the, the reductions we've experienced in Canada. I've said they're significant, they're meaningful, because these reductions, almost 5% since 2005, have happened while the economy has been growing. I think all members of this House would like to see that economy grow faster. Our government is committed to that. Our economic action plan is committed to that. But we've been able to grow the economy while also reducing greenhouse gases. Our sector-by-sector -sector industry consultation will help us achieve the goals in the, in the future. As per his statements on wind, Mr. Speaker, I think in Ontario, it's, it's the, the provincial Liberal government has essentially put a, a moratorium on local communities deciding. In our work internationally, Canada's working with our international partners, and if those international partners want to invest in wind, and we can, through fast-track financing, help that, we've done that, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke North. Mr. Speaker, um, I'd like the Honourable Member to know, while the Conservative government deployed Canadian diplomats to lobby Fortune 500 companies in the United States to counter a global warming campaign, 2011 proved to be the year of weather extremes in the States. In fact, 14 extreme weather events caused losses of U.S. $1 billion each. The worst tornado outbreak in history hit the southern states, with April recording a staggering 753 tornadoes and beating the previous record record by a startling 39 percent. The Conservative government continues to fail in meeting international climate change commitments, setting science-based emission reduction targets, developing incentives for low-carbon technologies, and putting in place adaptation measures necessary to respond to the risks of climate change. I will ask again, what does his government plan to do to close the megaton gap? Before Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to uh, thank the Honourable Member from the Liberal Party for, for uh, asking her question and for her well-researched and thoughtful remarks today. Certainly, in some ways, my, uh, my overview of the Liberal Party's record, which is disastrous uh, post-Kyoto, uh, in many ways she can't take many, much of that blame. She was not in the House. Most of their members uh, were part of, the, part of that government. And I'd remind Canadians that they signed Kyoto and then did nothing. They, there were announcements, there were consultations, there were one-ton challenges. The reality, Mr. Speaker, is that greenhouse gas reductions went up. 30%. There was no meaningful consultation working collaboratively with industry, like our government is doing. And the result was talking a good game on greenhouse gas reductions while doing nothing. Our government is committed to a balance I, I spoke of in my remarks, Mr. Speaker. That balance is meaningful achievable and helpful targets while also making sure that we don't cause more unemployment in this country. It's a balanced approach that I think is working, Mr. Speaker, a 4.8 percent reduction, the first of any government in Canadian history, and we're going to build upon that. 